Welcome to Get Better Basketball Live. I'm Coach DeMarco, and today my guest is Swarthmore College Assistant Basketball Coach T.J. Ferrick. Coach Ferrick is going to talk about ways to break in as a young, aspiring coach. You're not going to want to miss this episode. Before we jump into it, make sure you hit that like button down below, turn on your notifications, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Another Get Better Basketball Live is up now. Coach DeMarco here with Get Better Basketball Live, and today my guest is Coach TJ Farrick, assistant basketball coach at Swarthmore College. Coach, thanks for joining me today. Coach, thanks for having me on. This is, um, this is awesome. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, talking a little bit about, you know, advice for aspiring coaches that you have. And as we kind of jump into that topic, I want to ask you a little bit about your background. Can you just take us through how you got into coaching basketball and then, you know, worked your way up to being a college assistant coach? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I'll start back in, in high school. I, I played in high school, uh, a, a private Quaker school in Philadelphia called Penn Charter. Um, and I was not a good player. Uh, we, we had some pretty good teams. I was not a good player. Uh, I ended up being able to play in college, Earlham College, which is a small Quaker school in Indiana. Um, and after, and again, I was a bad player on very bad teams. Um, after college, uh, I, I thought that I was done with basketball. Uh, I did. I taught for a year in Thailand, and then I came back to the United States, and I got a job teaching part time at Ben Charter, the school that I went to. Uh, and I, I started that year coaching JV basketball and uh, boys JV basketball and and varsity. Uh, and I found that I I, I really loved that, um, but it was only something that I did during the season. And I did it for seven seasons uh, under two different coaches. The first four years under a guy named Leonard Stewart, who was a really good really good player. Uh, and then the second three years under um, a guy named Jim Phillips, who was actually my high school coach. Um, and so at the end of those seven years, uh, I was about to turn 30 and uh, had to, you know, had kind of a, a moment where I, that, that seventh season, there were, it was my least successful. Uh, I, I, there were so many things that I failed and I, but I was trying things. Um, and I, I really realized then that plus the, the fact that I was nearing 30, like, what do I want to do with my life? And it, the answer was obvious that I wanted to coach basketball. Um, and so basically when I turned 30, I decided, okay, I'm going to go for this. Um, and flip who was the coach, he ended up leaving. I knew I wasn't going to get hired at, at head coach of Penn Charter. Um, so I, the, the new coach, John, who came in, I became the middle school coach the next year. And I decided I, I wanted to maybe try to get into college basketball. So the, the season of 2018-19, I, I visited colleges in the area, went to practices, tried to make connections, and then that summer worked camps. And I ended up getting the position at Swarthmore uh, for the 19-20 season. Coach, that's a pretty cool journey. I, I had a similar experience. I came back and coached my former high school team, my first year right out of college actually, and coached football and basketball, and then kind of worked my way up the ranks and then had kind of that moment too, where I was like, you know, do I want to go the coaching route, either football or basketball, you know, or am I going to kind of stay in education primarily and go that route? And, you know, I went back, got my doctorate and became an administrator, which has kind of taken me away from the team coaching piece. And I really do, I really do miss that. But I appreciate kind of that journey. And it sounds like you went through that similar experience. And I want to ask you, as you went through those kind of seven years as a coach at your former school and working with players, and what was, what was that like for you? What was it like to go back and coach at your former school? And then um, what did you learn from that experience that led you to be like, you know what, this is for me, this is what I want to do. And I want to try to, you know, make my way up to the college ranks at some point. So, like I said, when I first started coaching, I kind of was in, in a, I don't know if you felt the same way too. I, I, I came in and I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to be an educator. Um, and, and coaching was just something I was teaching part-time at first and they had me coaching three sports and I didn't really even want to do it that much at first. Um, but uh, over the, over those seven years, the first four was with, uh, like I said, Lennard and Lennard, it was his first time ever being a head coach. And so as it, I became basically like the head assistant for the final two and a half years or so. And I, I just, he let me do a lot of stuff. I got to try a lot of things and I got to, you know, 
do things the wrong way in many cases. Um, but at the end of those four years, I felt that I had really moved from, I think when we all start, we start with this idea of like X's and O's, right? I, I think maybe even as a football coach, maybe even more so, it's just like, it's all about plays and strategy and winning and losing. And I, by the end of those four years, I had moved to just the more conceptual understanding of how to, how to coach and how to get the most out of a team. And I had a really good team uh, that, that year. Um, the following three years were, were difficult and I was kind of like in limbo a little bit, um, spinning wheels. Cause you know, like you said, you had that moment where it's, do I want to be an educator? Do I want to be a coach? Can I, you know, figure that out? And I, and I realized just knowing myself that I, I would be a terrible administrator. So, <laughs> so I, I, I can't, I just, I can't, I, I, I don't have the skill set or the like aptitude, the aptitudes to do that. And, um, that's not why I, I chose coaching. I, co I chose coaching because I, you know, had a, a moment or moments where I soul searched and I said, what I really want to do. And that's what I wanted to do. But I, I think, you know, like you, like you described that same moment where it's like, where, you know, where do we go? I, I knew that I, I wasn't going to go the administrative route. And then for three years, I was kind of like, all right, what am I doing at the, that, that seventh year I had a JV team and, and there was a point in the season, there were several points, but one point specifically when I realized maybe I actually don't know how to teach basketball. Um, maybe I've been doing this wrong the whole time. And so I started looking into player development. I always thought that I knew about it. I always thought that I understood it because I played and I coached. And what I realized when I started researching it was that I actually didn't, <laughs> I didn't know how to get players better. I didn't really know how to, how to optimally teach the game. Um, and how it was so different than teaching in the classroom with English, teaching basketball, this dynamic, complex sport and and so that I just became fascinated with player development and that's that's really made me decide that I, I love this and I wanted to coach the rest of my life. Coach as you uh, you know work as an assistant basketball coach and you transition from high school to college I'm always interested in this because I know there's a lot of high school coaches that do aspire to someday move up to the college game and What's your role like, you know, when you're a high school assistant, now you've transitioned to a college assistant, what are the similarities and what are some of the differences in, in that role? So in, in my experience, my experience, I mean, everyone's experience is unique, of course, but um, the season of, of 18, 19, I was like visiting all these practices and, and like trying to make connections and get into college basketball. And I went to Swarthmore's practice and I was, or I went to see Swalcourt play because I was going to meet the coaches from Dickinson. They were playing Dickinson. And I was like, they're doing something different here. And so I went and I saw them practice and I was, I was pretty blown away. Uh, and so I really wanted to be at Swalcourt. Um, and I was able to make that happen. But that, that season, 18-19, Swalcourt was in the D3 National Championship. Um, and they had, they graduated, you know, two seniors and they brought back their entire coaching staff. Like I wasn't replacing anyone, but they did bring me on. So the responsibilities that I had um, were like almost nothing. I was essentially like a glorified ball boy in practice, but being part of that culture and that, um, you know, this, this program that is, is Landry and, and the players and everyone else has built into what it is now was the best experience of my life, you know, to this point. But so it's hard for me to compare because in high school, I did a lot of things in college. I didn't, do much at all but just being part of that I learned so much yeah I think that's a good segue into I know you put together some some slides some notes and I think that's a good segue because I feel like there's a, a an aspect of moving up in the ranks where you have to kind of do your time you know like you're before you're an administrator in school you're a teacher and you kind of work your way up to that process and before you're a head coach you're an assistant coach and so on and so forth and and you work your way up the ranks but Feel like at the college level you know there's that entry level position and you kind of find your niche and then you work your way up the ranks again so I feel like there's an element of patience um, as you kind of develop at, as as a coach as there is in any really in any career so I'm looking forward to jumping into this presentation I had a chance to look at some of the slides and I think you have some really good feedback and input for for coaches so let's check it out all right so um I have three different topics that I want to talk about. I'm going to start with um, some, I don't even want to call it advice, but a, just a kind of a different approach for young and aspiring coaches uh, who want to break in um, 
I, I was 29 when I um, decided that I want to try to break into coaching really. And there are a lot of, I think there are a lot of um, aspiring coaches and, and manager managers, grad assistants who are between the ages of 20, 25, who are wondering of, of ways to break in. Um, and I, I had an opportunity to be on a bunch of zoom calls and, and um, stuff at the, at the beginning of the pandemic back in March. Um, and I realized that, you know, there, there are some, that there are some, some commonalities with the advice that, that is given to coaches who want to break into to college basketball. And, and um, my story is just a little bit different. Um, and so I wanted to highlight, you know, the, the kind of the traditional advice that I, that I heard a lot of college coaches giving to younger aspiring coaches and then give some actionable, like specific things that I did or things that looking back, maybe I would have done um, when I decided that I wanted to break in when I was 29. So the traditional advice, the first thing that everyone harps on is network, network, network. Um, and uh, that's, that's great. And, and that was one of my first things when I broke in, I didn't know anyone in basketball period uh, in Philadelphia, in high school. And, and so I, my, one of my first things was make connections, but, um, there is, uh, just an overwhelming emphasis on networking. Um, and that's, that's all well and good. Um, I think that a lot of the, that emphasis on networking places, um, kind of the goal outside of oneself. Uh, and so what I, what I'm thinking about here and and some of this stuff is what I would call a me first approach to breaking in rather than thinking about what you need to do to kind of um, make a name for yourself and to, to connect with everyone else, think more about growing yourself, uh, as a coach, um, as a means to get to where you want to go. Cause, um, I found, and I think you said you found like where you think you want to go is not always uh, over time. It may change. Um, but I think taking a growth approach for yourself is, is um, a different way to approach it. And so I want to give some actionable advice for that. So Coach, uh, network- a question about the, the networking piece, you know, for you, what did, what did that look like? I know obviously social media is a, a big piece of it for a lot of people, but are there some other things you did to connect with other coaches? I'm looking at the second point I'm seeing go to a lot of clinics, learn as much as you can. So are there some other things you did to connect with coaches? Yeah. Um, so that, like, that's what I tried to, like, when I first started, I was like, made three things. It was connect and network. Uh, I needed to continue to grow myself as a coach. And then I wanted to understand recruiting better because I had no idea what that was all about. Uh, but the number one thing was connections. And so like for like 18 months, I was like trying to figure out the way to network. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit later about a specific kind of strategy that I came up with, but um, what I found most effective was being pretty um, specific and deliberate in like who I was trying to connect with. And those people weren't like the top people. It was just people that I thought I aligned with um, in terms of the philosophy and um, and I would just go see them in person. That was, <laughs> that was, my, that was my approach. Um, and I tried to work camps. I couldn't get into hoop group. So I drove up to hoop group. They don't lock the doors. Um, and I uh, ended up just sitting there all day and ended up getting a position at the next camp. And then I was at hoop group. So I got to connect with people there. I think just putting yourself in the place um, to meet people that that's kind of what I found to be the way that was most effective for me. That's awesome. Um, yeah. And I'll talk, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time here, but when the pandemic started, there were all these clinics, the online clinics, and it was like, go to a thousand clinics and learn, 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 learn. And I want to talk a little bit about what learning real learning looks like. Uh, and, and that it's not just accumulation of information. It's a more holistic kind of, um, approach. Um, be willing to move across the country, work for no money. Um, and like, no one cares how good you are, uh, and that someone else that you, from your network will get you your first job get, and get your foot in the door. You being a great, a good coach, uh, won't really matter. Um, and there's, there's a lot of focus on like, what's your, why, why are you, why do you want to coach? Um, and then there's a lot of this other, um, advice. And again, I'm not, I'm not trying to knock any of this. I think like these, the coaches who are giving these younger coaches, um, this advice, uh, that's the way they got to where they are and they're trying to help. I just had a little bit of a different path and I want to give some specific um, things that coaches can do. So I want to talk about learning real quick. Um, here's, 
someone came to me and asked me like, I want to break into coaching. I'm 21 years old. What should I do? Here's the playbook that I would give them. Um, and here's the first thing is that no more content, no more podcasts, no more books, no more clients for three months. Take everything that you've learned and consolidate it, review it and consolidate it into um, kind of one document. And from there, I think categories of where you're interested in and what you really want to learn more about will start to arise. Uh, and you can start to focus on those things in your coaching, whether it be X and O's, uh, player development, um, uh, like what other areas that uh, like defense, like whatever it is, those categories will arise as you review your, your learnings from the past. Um, and so people are producing content. There's so much content out there and great content, but if you're just taking it in all the time without reviewing it, um, that that isn't real learning. Uh, learning isn't really happening. And then the next step after you review and consolidate the learnings is to um, put it into action. And so advice that I would give for people who are trying to break into college coaching or maybe in college coaching and thinking about like, you know, they're a, a manager or a grad assistant and thinking about like, how can I get to the next thing um, is coach basketball. Uh, I think that if you were able to coach basketball as much as possible, and this is, this is something that I took from Chris Oliver, Chris Oliver, he talked about when he was in his twenties, uh, he was, he coached as many teams as he possibly could. And so that's how you take the things that you've learned and kind of you apply them and then you learn more by doing that. And that's, these are some things that I did um, over the years. I did a lot of small group workouts. I, I was coaching directly. I coached at AAU. Uh, I did camps, but not too many camps. And uh, I prioritized making, con connecting with coaches that were local to me, not just any coaches. Uh, and then whatever I was interested in at the time, mostly shooting, I tried to get the station that was like the shooting station or <laughs> so I could work on some of the things that I was learning uh, and, and uh, listening to coaches and, and talking to people. Um, and then the other thing that I, that I found to be effective, I, I appointed myself an intern for uh, a scout uh, named Ari Rosenfeld, who was a former student of mine, actually. I called him and I said, Ari, I'm your intern now. And so I, could, uh, so I would go to AAU tournaments and high school live events and fall leagues and stuff and practice evaluation. Uh, you know, a lot of what older assistant coaches that talk about and head coaches in college, they talk about, you know, can you help with recruiting? That's, that's what staffs are looking for. And, and so I compiled a list of prospects in the area that were all like D3 fringe uh, high academic prospects. And that was one of the things that when I sent, when I connected with Swarthmore was trying to get a position there, that was one of the things that Landry mentioned as, you know, a uh, um, thing that, it's a piece of paper with a bunch of names on it and kids that I've seen have evaluations on them. And so I would go out and evaluate as much as possible uh, if you're trying to get into college basketball. And then this is my, this is my networking thing that I came up with. I don't know if it's, it's kind of dumb, I guess, but uh, I call it the three minute rule. So in person, I would be at camps or um, AU tournaments or whatever fall league, summer leagues. And I would only, for a while, I would just try, go around and try to like shake hands and get numbers and meet everyone. But over time, I kind of adapted my approach to, I would only introduce myself to someone if I could have a three minute conversation with them. Uh, in that conversation, I try to make some sort of personal connection. Um, and then the most important part of this is follow up uh, t within 12 hours. Uh, and when you do follow up, usually I found it better to do that on, on social media and try to include something about the personal connection and you know, I, I, again, I just kind of codified this into that, this three minute rule, but this is what I found to be effective is trying to have like short conversations or, you know, even longer conversations and then following up that made more lasting connections. Yeah. I think that's a really good point, you know, coach, cause you can work at a lot of different camps or be out and about at games. You meet a lot of people, you shake hands, how you doing? I'm such and such, but making that personal connection and taking that ownership to say, you know what? I'm going to spend a little time talking to this person, let them get to see who I am as a coach. And then the follow-up I think is a really, really important piece. So I think, I do think that's good advice for coaches because, you know, there's, there's networking, you can go somewhere and you can meet a lot of different people at a given time, but
But to have those personal conversations and then the follow through, I really do think that that makes a, a big difference. And it probably makes a big difference for those other coaches who are, who are connecting with you as well. Um, for sure. I, you know, one other thing I wanted to bring up, you mentioned sort of the, uh, the online clinics and I feel like in the spring, like your head could have been spinning because it was so many clinics and you could have just taken in, taken in, taken in so much information, but I think there's really good advice in that too. And I feel like coaches are starting to shift that way a little more, like be more intentional about what you're learning and what you're taking in and, you know, and weeding some stuff out. But I want to ask you, like, how, how challenging is that for you to, you know, weed out some of the, you know, there's, there's a million clinics you can go to and kind of picking and choosing. And how do you do that? What, what's your process for sort of thinking like, you know what, I want to go see, you know, this clinic because it aligns with my values. Or I want to go see this clinic because it's a topic I'm interested in. How, how do you, what's that process like for you? Because there's so much information now and you can get overwhelmed by it. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a great question. And, and for me, it, it just worked out easier in like spring 2020 when all this, you know, like the, the pandemic and all these, and when I really started my, my coaching journey was, was spring 2018. And I was really interested in player development. So I had, I had done by that point, like two years of kind of learning about player development and skill development and skill acquisition. And, um, and so by the time all those clinics came up, I kind of had a, a good idea in my mind of what, what kind of people, what I was looking for specifically, which was like skill acquisition, skill development, and then some other stuff too. And then I, by that point, I was, um, I only went to clinics really with non-American coaches um, because I had found that I was learning the most and like learning the most, like I take one thing, if I take one thing that I, or two things from something, like I'm not trying to take everything, but I found that I was learning the most from Canadian, Australian, uh, German um, coaches. And I also, I would also, and the, I don't even know if this is like a strategic thing. I would also like, if there was a really obscure college, like Our Lady of the Lakes, Texas or something like that, dribble drive offense, like I would check that out. Um, because the, like, I, like I said, I had found that I'd, I'd learned a lot from, from non-American coaches. And then the, the small college coaches who are, who have very like implemented specific systems, uh, I felt like I took a lot away from those too. Yeah. And I feel like sometimes with the coaches from overseas, there's that their player development emphasis, at least from what I've seen uh, in a short amount of time tends to be on like small sided games and uh, like more of a games based approach. And I think you're seeing more of that here in the States as well. Um, but I, at least that's been my experience overseas is, is it tends to be more of that type of approach, which is a little different from some of what you might get from, you know, whoever that's coached for 40 years in basketball, that's going to take you through what worked for them. Um, you know, the, the SSG approach is obviously more cutting edge and something that you see a little bit more of. Um, you know, one of the things that I noticed in your presentation is the uh, portfolio piece, which I'm interested about because I've, I've talked a little bit about this myself and um, I thought you had some really great points um, on the portfolio. Sure. Yeah. Um, this, this come, this idea of a portfolio kind of comes from, uh, I guess what I was trying to do when I thought about getting into college coach, and I thought like, in addition to a resume and a cover letter, uh, like I'm, I was just very outside of the world of college basketball. And I, and I just thought in addition to a resume and a cover letter, I should have some things, some work that I've done to show. Um, and so I remember being on a call in, in March or April and, um, there was uh, this idea of like, uh, you know, as coaches, like as coaches, maybe like don't try to create things. Um, I don't even know what it was, but I think that I think that you should try to be trying to create things like a few things, not not many, but a few things that um, are a few pieces of content that can be taken in uh, by someone who you're trying to impress or to get a job from whatever. Um, and so, yeah, I, these are some things that I did, but you know, for young coaches, they're, they're so much more tech savvy than you or me. Yeah, no, I know. I mean, I, I, well, I mean, I think the number one thing, and I, I love that you put this on here is I think a lot of, a lot of young 
or aspiring coaches, whatever their age is, but um, a lot of them don't have portfolios and they're not putting together those samples and that information. And so I've actually shared with some coaches, you know, similar, I, I like it, the recruit list, the player evals, the video component, unique things that you might've created, things that might work for you that kind of show your personality. I, I really like that one that you just mentioned, um, w- which is really good. But, you know, for me, my, my experience was always a lot, a lot of coaches might not have it. I remember uh, as an up and coming coach, I had one coach said, you know, when you go there, sit down in the interview and, um, you know, you'll sit at this long table. There might be three people there. There might be 20 people there. And I've been in both types of interviews in my experience, but you know, you open your, this is my portfolio and, you know, here you go and you pass it along and it gives them stuff to look at as you're going through and you can reference it. And, you know, so that's something that I've always taken with me. And I think that's, that's really great advice, but I, I love that you mentioned unique things that, that you've created because I think it, your personality kind of comes out in that. And also, you know, what's in, what's important to you. And I, I want to ask you kind of thinking about that. Um, is there something specifically that you've included uh, in your portfolio or that you maybe not yet, but something that you might include, you know, later on down the line in your portfolio that is unique to you and something that, um, you know, you might've created along the way. Yeah. I, there are a few things that I I've created. One of, one of the, again, like things that you know, I just put unique things created by, by you. I think like, um, it's like whatever you're skilled at, like, um, and, and I, in college, I was a philosophy major and I, and I wrote a lot. And so like writing is a skill that I have. And, and, um, when I apply for jobs, I, I write a different cover letter than I think, um, most people write just because that's that's a thing that I can do that's unique um, and maybe will make me stand out. Um, another thing I, I remember in the in the when I sent this stuff to Landry, one of the things that I included was uh, I had this presentation on uh, language based co- coaching strategies, which I was really into at the time, like um, active verbs and uh, and I it was like three years ago, two years ago. And I was, but when I first got into player development, I was an English teacher. So I was, I had this crossover between the interest in language and um, motor and this interest in skill acquisition. And there's a lot of research out there about that. Uh, and so I put together a presentation on that. And that was one thing that, that was unique, you know, a unique part of my portfolio. I think but those I, things stand out those, too. When the, people, when people see that stuff, they see the writing component a language-based strategy you're talking about it's unique it's unique to you and like you know they, they it, it at least makes them want to say hey like you tell me more about this and I think that's an important strategy as you're applying for jobs people to ask that hey I, I'm interested to learn about this it's unique it's different tell me a little little bit about it and I'm seeing here too your your social media approach which I know is a hot tie I know there's coaches who you know get jobs I, I just actually a coach who Football coach, really popular on TikTok, um, does a great job. And he's a high school coach in Texas. And now he's coaching, uh, just got a job at Washington State, Division I, um, you know, as a, as a football coach. And, and really, you know, a, a, the way of him putting himself out there was through social media. And I think they could see, I mean, for me, it, using TikTok and you're a Division I coach and you're seeing this coach who, has a really good skill set. He's a great football coach too. I don't want to take that away, but you know, now you're thinking about recruiting players and, and how his personality can lend itself to the recruiting. So he's highly skilled and he can recruit players, you know, social media wise. So I thought that was a really cool story that this just happened in the last week or so, but the social media approach is definitely important nowadays. Yeah. I mean, and when you think about a portfolio like that, his social media is part of his portfolio. Like that's a unique, you know what I mean? Like you're, you can make your social media a part of your portfolio. And, and I just put a few different ways. I just think social media is how you choose to use it. Um, and these are some ways in which you can choose to use any social media platform, specifically Twitter. Uh, I've, when I first decided that I wanted to coach, I remember I consolidated my Twitter follows. I had a Twitter account that I didn't use and I had, I was following 2000, 3000, just everyone. Uh, and I realized that I could learn a ton from this as a, in my quest to become a great basketball coach. And so I made a new account and I consolidated the people I was following down to just basketball coaches. And for about a year, I used that just to ask questions and, and learn. Um, and so social media really is like 
it is how we choose to use it. And you can choose to use it in a way that um, can enhance your learning and also if you, you know, enhance your portfolio. Yeah, it's a great point. You know, for me, you know, high school coach uh, for a lot of years and, and I just kind of got into the social media when I transitioned, my kids were born, I went the administrative route, transitioned into the social media. And yeah, I went from like, I think I had 148 followers as, as a high school coach, you know, or 200 followers to almost 6,000 people now. And that continues to grow. But, you know, for me, I think a lot of it has to do with how I've used it and how I've, I've really tried to make it as positive as possible and promote other coaches and positive things that are happening and players that I work with or, you know, even other players out there. So I think, you know, your social media approach can really, really help you to grow and expand your network and also obviously help, you know, to get jobs as, as a young, up and coming, aspiring coach. Appreciate your insight and your perspective. Tons of great uh, feedback on uh, this topic. So, you know, thanks again for joining me tonight. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. This was, this was awesome. I really enjoyed it.